We're almost done. I was doing some calculations, and we have 10,368,000 seconds left of our high school. <laughs> That's equivalent to 121, 20 days. And throughout that whole time, we've been there for each other. Throughout our entire high school, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, we've been there for each other. Through the hard times, the good times, and the sad times. The good times, playing soccer, basketball, uh, baseball, when we lose, when we win. Um, we've also been, each, been there for each other in the bad times and sad times. When schools were getting really tough and we're having a hard time and we just really need someone to lift us up, we've always been there for each other. Uh, we've also been there for each other when maybe our spiritual life's not where we want it to be. We have friends we can go talk to and they'll always lift us up and help us. So, in 10,368 seconds, thousand seconds, what are we going to do? We're all going to be leaving, and some of us we might not even see again. Uh, some of us may be going to college together, but that'll be small groups. Some of us may be able to see each other on home leave since we live close to each other. But other than that, we're going to be leaving each other, and it's sad to think that we might not even see some of each other again. So. What are you going to do to keep growing spiritually and keep your connection with God strong? So that's my, what my talk's going to be about today. Um, I was trying to think of a Bible example of who I could base my sermon off of, and I was thinking about it, and David came to mind. Uh, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, God is t talking through Samuel uh, to Saul, and he says this. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. Uh, and that man, a man after his own heart, is David. God calls David a man after his own heart. I mean, that's pretty crazy to think about. God calling a human, us, God so big, is calling one of us a man after his own heart. So my talk is about how we can become men and women after God's own heart. So there's three points that I thought of that why David was called a man after God's own heart. Number one, David loved the word of God. Number two, David loved to pray. And number three, David loved to worship God. So point number one, David loved the word of God. In Psalms 119, 97, if you turn there, it says, Oh, how I love your law. I meditate it on it all day long. Here David's saying, I love the Word of God, I meditate it, I think about it, I read it all day long. He's constantly thinking about what God has to say, what God wants to do in his life, and he's constantly thinking and trying to understand what God wants from him. If we go back to verse 47 and 48, it says, For I delight in your commands because I love them. I reach out for your commands which I love, that I meditate it on your decrees. Here, David is again saying he loves them so much and he can spend all day in him. Uh, turn the page back one more to verse 11. It says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. David memorized the Bible, he, or what, the, what he had of the Bible, and he used it uh, to protect him against sin. Uh, he used it to keep uh, his relationship strong with Jesus Christ. Um, I was reading a story about a man in Tennessee. His name is Charles Matlock. Um, he has a photographic memory, and um, whenever he was 12 years old, he was doing some homework, maybe math or something, it was, and he realized the gift he had, and so he was like, how can I use this for the glory of God? And he just started memorizing scriptures. And so 40 years later, he has almost memorized the entire Bible, and you can walk up to him, ask him any verse, and he will be able to like look off into a space like he's picturing it in his mind, and then he'll recite it word for word, whatever. He's memorized like books of the Bible, entire books. And um, just like David, he hid it in his heart, and he's using his talent for the glory of God. Okay, point number one, David loved the word of God. Point number two, David loved to pray. Uh, if we turn to Psalms 116, Verses 1 through 10, or 1 through 2, says, David's talking, I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy. 
Because he turned his ear to me, I will call on him as long as I live. Here he says, he called on the Lord, and the Lord answered. And from then on, David was excited. He was like, when I call on him, he'll be there for me. I don't need to worry about anything. He'll always be when I call, when I pray to him. And uh, next, skip a few verses to verse 12. David says, what shall I return to the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. David was thinking, what can I give to God? God has everything. I, can, I don't have anything in my possession that he wants. And so he's like, well, I guess I'll just call on him. I'll pray to him. I'll spend time talking with him. That was his way of giving gifts back to God. And you can guess, ask God anything. There's a story about a soldier in World War II. Uh, he was fighting in the Pacific War on one of the islands. And he got separated from his unit, his group of men. He was all by himself, and he heard the Japanese coming, getting closer to him. So he hid in a cave, in a small cave, and he was like, all right, I'm safe right now. But then he heard the Japanese searching each cave, and he was like, what am I going to do? They're going to find me. So he prayed to God. He's like, God, please help me. Uh, hide me. Uh, bring up a brick wall in front of me to protect me. And he's like, all right. I did what I did. And then nothing happened. He was waiting, staying there, and they get closer and closer. But then he saw a spider. A spider came, and it started making layer and layer of web in front of the cave and just... Um, making a huge spider web in front of his cave that he was in. And he thought to himself, well, I asked for a brick wall, and God gave me a spider web. How is this going to help? <laughs> um, but then, when the Japanese soldiers came to his cave, they just glanced at it and kept walking. And that's when he realized, he's like, what? God sent this spider to protect me because they think that it's been there forever, but it was just here like two minutes ago. So <laughs> God used the spider to protect this guy from the Japanese soldiers. Now some of you might say, well, I don't have those big of a problems. I'm not being hunted by Japanese. I'm not going to die. I, I don't have anything God uh, can give me. I don't, the things I want are stupid. Um, but you can ask God anything. I remember when I was younger, um, we used to pray every night. And so we would get there and pray. Each one of our family would pray. And uh, every once in a while, my mom would say, like, Dear God, thank you for this great day. Um, please open and close the doors in our life and lead us in the right direction. And I heard this. I was like, oh, that's pretty cool. So uh, one time, I, was, I got down on my hands and knees. I started praying. I was like, Dear God, thank you for this great day. Please give us a nice rest tonight. Uh, please open and, door and close the doors in our life. Lead us in the right direction. But don't slam them. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. But I guess my mom had heard me slam the door once, and she said, don't do that. So I was going to tell God, make sure you don't slam the doors in our face. Just close them nicely. <laughs> Another story. I was in kindergarten. And in kindergarten, I could not sit still. I was constantly jumping, moving around, standing up in my seat, doing whatever I wanted, because I was just super hyper. And my teacher one day got really annoyed. And she was like, Austin, if you don't sit down in your seat, I'm going to glue you to the seat. And I was like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? So that night, guess what I prayed? I prayed, dear God, please help my teacher not to glue me to the seat. <laughs> and my teacher never glued me to the seat. <laughs> All right, so point number two, David loved to pray. And you can pray about anything. Point number one was David loved the word of God. So point number three, David loved to praise God. If you turn to... Uh, Psalms 119, verse 164, says, Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous laws. This is talking about seven times a day he would just stop what he was doing and just praise him, sing to him, dance, just do whatever he wanted. But I can't say that I do that. I don't praise God seven times a day. Maybe I do it like Sabbath school, church, um, worships, when we sing or stuff like that. But I can't say I do it seven times a day. In a verse, or chapter 104, 33, David says as long as he lived, he was going to do this. So he did it seven times a day for as long as he lived. I was thinking, why would David want to do this? Why would David want to praise God for as long as he lived seven times a day? Because that's a lot of commitment. That's just constantly praising God. 
So I found out verse, or Psalms 95, verse 1 through 3, it says, Come, let us sing for the joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with our thanksgiving and exalt him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. So there's the reason right there. David says, let's praise him because he is great. He is awesome. He is the God of gods, the king of gods. He is above all else. That was the reason why um, David was praising God. And David would praise God no matter what. There's a story in 2 Samuel 6. David is bringing back the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. He is, uh, because it has been taken by the enemy, and he finally, they had gotten it. He's bringing it back to Jerusalem. And he has all of Israel there with him. They're all singing, dancing, praising God. And in the Bible it says, all David was wearing was a linen ephod. If you don't know what that is, that's just his underwear. So he was in front of his entire kingdom, his entire Israel, in his underwear, dancing and praising God. He didn't care what think people thought of him. He was just going to do what he had to do to praise God. And later, when he, back, when he got back to his palace, one of his wives, Michael, said, told him, why did you do that? Why did you embarrass yourself in front of the entire Israel nation and just dance in your underwear? And this is what he says. He says, I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. So David was willing to be humiliated in his own eyes to worship God. He didn't care what people thought of him or what he was doing. He was going to praise God for as long as he lived, seven times a day. So, point number one, David loved the word of God. Point number two, David loved to pray. Point number three, David loved to praise God. Now, some of you are saying, well, I praise God and I pray. That's two out of the three. I'm pretty good. I think I'm, I'll make it. But no, you need all three. So can I get the three guys I asked to come up here real quick? So Kyler here, he's going to be praying to God. Come up here. And Josh, you're going to be praising God. And Brett, you're going to be the word of God. So all three of these guys, when they lean back, they're all supporting each other. They're pretty strong. You can kind of push them, and they're going to counterbalance each other to stay strong. But what happens when you are missing one? So let's say Kyler. See, the other two fall. You need all three. You guys can go sit down. You need all three to uh, be working together to grow and have a relationship with Jesus Christ and become a man or woman after God's own heart. So my challenge for you is to use all three of these tools to grow in your spiritual life and to become a man or woman after God's own heart.
Good morning. Although um, this morning I am talking to the seniors, I also hope others in the crowd will be able to get something from this talk as well. Identity. How would you define this uh, simple word? When I looked it up, this is what it said. Identity is the collective aspect of the set of characteristics by which a thing is definitively recognizable or known. Well, I'm sure all of you could have told me this, and undoubtedly in a simpler way. But this isn't really the question I want to ask. The question is, how do our identities truly affect us? So again, what is identity? Being defined as character, existence, integrity, name, oneness, personality or selfness, brings a new dimension to something that is seemingly much more than a social security number or a first, middle, and last name. At Campion, many of us seniors have been attending this school for three and a half years now, while others may have only come at the beginning of this last semester. Regardless of how long we have been here, we all were new students at some point. We were given an opportunity to create new identities for ourselves. Some may have completely changed from their grade school selves, while others only did away with their childhood nickname. When I was in grade school, uh, I looked like a little boy, like literally. My hair was two inches long and I wore my brother's hand-me-downs. But at least I didn't show up to um, freshman registration looking like a fourth grader. <laughs> but as the days passed, we slowly became acquainted with each other. Our identities were formed through our looks, actions, and the words we spoke. Now a semester, or even three and a half years later, most of our identities are very recognizable. For some, it may be an instrument, such as a banjo or a viola. Others, it may be a sport, like soccer. And I know we could all name those of our classmates that are found at the front of the classroom arguing about getting their test grades changed from a 98% to 103%. <laughs> but more importantly than these one-sided characteristics are our real identities. Things such as kind words, assertiveness, humor, shyness, or a bubbly personality. As of right now, we have an identity of who our true self really is. But as Shakespeare wrote, we know what we are, but not what we may be. Is this true? Do we as seniors not know what will become after graduation? Just as we established our identities at Campion, we have a similar opportunity ahead of us. Some of us seniors will continue to an Adventist college, while others a public university. Some will be traveling across the country to an Ivy League school, and some may not attend college at all. No matter the case, we are faced with a new beginning, a change of identity. Out with the old and in with the new, Sounds like a great idea to most of us at this point. But whether we admit it or not, the future has brought doubt into our thoughts. Where we will be, who we will meet, what will we do, how will we get there, and more importantly, who will we become? Out with the old and in with the new, in reality, is much easier said than done. But whether we have accepted it or not, our lives are about to change. Going back to the identities that some of our class members hold now, I'm not trying to say that once we leave Campion, we have to leave our love for a sport or our witty humor behind once we graduate. 
but we are presented with the, a possibility of deciding who we want others to see us as. We are granted with the opportunity of success. Much of success is centered on opportunity. Well, there is good news. We are graduating. That right there can be our opportunity. Now, what you deem as success is entirely up to you, but at the same time, it is still just a part of what our identities will be. I have more good news. We have been given a whole book full of stories about people changing their identities. One story is that of a woman by the name of Mary. Now, Mary was a prostitute, and this young woman was so lost in her lifestyle that she was even dragged into the streets to be stoned. But with the turn of a page, a change of identity, she went from a prostitute to a princess of the eternal king. She even washed the feet of a man who went on to save the entire world. No longer was she a woman from the streets, but she was now a follower of God. This is just one story. Fishers were changed to disciples, a shepherd to a king, even a criminal hanging on his cross in his final hours was changed. The value of identity, of course, is that so often with it comes purpose. As God is the authors of our book, we were once perfect. Now our pages have been ripped, we've been dropped in the mud, and discarded only to be found much later again. Luckily though, as I said before, God is our author, which also means he has the power of editing. While sometimes he may only make small changes to our covers or to the ending of our book, other times, he writes a story completely different from what we initially thought. No matter how much editing is involved, our identity is formed for a purpose. Once we leave Campion, we will find ourselves as one drop in the ocean of people. But no matter how cliche it may sound, one drop still makes a ripple. Given the opportunity to find our purpose, our identities may begin to change. Maybe you already are who you want to be or who God wants you to be, and maybe you're not. Often, it's not about becoming a new person, but becoming the person you were meant to be and already are, but you just don't know how to be that person. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? Of course, we could all tell someone what color our eyes were or how long our hair is, but more than that, do you see a young adult striving to prepare themselves for the future? Or perhaps you see an individual lost in the thoughts of his or her life after graduation. Do you see the identity of the person you want to be? The reality is, who we are now will not be enough once we graduate. While this sounds extreme, it is true. It was just the same as when we came to high school. We grew and adapted to fit into the new and older world we were in. Growing up means learning what life is. When you're little, you have a set of standards, ideas, criteria, plans, and outlooks. And you think that you have to sit around and wait for them to happen to you, and then life will work. But life isn't like that for anyone. For I know the plans I have for you, declared the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. We have all probably heard this verse at least a couple times. We hear it and nonchalantly write it off as, well, yeah, okay, so I guess I will live my life how I want, the way I am, and that must have been God's plans for me. Here's a different way to look at it. Maybe God's plan is made for the person he intends for you to become. 
So rather than him designing a road for you to walk down, maybe he designed you specifically to walk down a certain path. God knows the plans he has for you, and those plans don't waver. Even if it seems like your path has taken a turn, this was actually how it's supposed to be. How will we truly understand his plans for us if we haven't become the person that they were made for? So now is the time for us to prepare, to assess, change, and refine our identities. For God has a path for you to take, and only when we model ourselves into the form he has created for us, will we truly see the plans we have been made for and the identities we need to fulfill those plans. So, class of 2014, the question is not, what does the future hold for us? But rather, what do you and God hold for the future? Please stand with us as we sing our closing song together, hymn number 547, Be Thou My Vision. Father God, as we meditate in the words spoken to us today about how to stay close to you and about finding our identities in you, may the reality be that only through you can we have vision. And so we pray as we have just sang, Lord, that you may be our vision, 
that you may be our light and our guide, that you might give us personally, as seniors, as not seniors, as senior citizens, the vision that only you can give us, the path that you have guided us through. But may the God of all grace who called us to his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settled you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>